of course, into these distinct lectures, but they're topical, some are shorter, some are longer. Uh, we got through uh, the first one about methodology last time. And uh, if you missed it, I did send a link to a related talk that hopefully covers the same material, although in a maybe less well-organized way. Um, so uh, I decided I'll start today on the second lecture, uh, partly because of the problems last time, but I will cover the first piece of it pretty quickly because uh, some of you have seen it before uh, just yesterday, but uh, you know, maybe you, you, you won't mind. Uh, yeah, so our goal is to figure out what I'm calling using this term of Nishida uh, Tatsuo's, uh, the sonus grammai of, of Chinese, which is what sound system is implied by the writing system itself. And I gave this example yesterday of, you know, uh, the spelling of the word English enough that would be an out. So what is the kind of equivalent of that uh, in Chinese? Uh, and we use Middle Chinese as the imposer. So I'm asking you at this point in the course to just take totally on faith Middle Chinese as if it were philologically recorded in um, Roman. And then I think, you know, I circulated beforehand this short essay of mine where I basically explained my system of writing Middle Chinese, uh, which is, you know, everyone has to have their own system in Chinese historical chronology. Uh, but it's designed to be sort of indological in its um, conventions, like using an N with a dot over it for the veal and nasal, and then hopefully uh, kind of pedagogically easy. So anyhow, I'm going to use that. And now, uh, and then the, the structure of the Chinese characters themselves are the transposer. Okay, so uh, the, the character for mother, so it's composed of two halves, one that means woman and one that means horse. So uh, one is the semantic component, one is the phonetic component. And uh, as a native speaker of Chinese of the relevant period, you're supposed to just see it and know, oh, it means something that sounds like horse and means something about a woman, right? So then we asked ourselves, well, what is it this actually, um, what is it this actually being indicated by the character? And then we saw that these three characters are all written with the horse phonetic, uh, and they all start with M, they all have the A vowel, and, but they have different tones. So the character is not telling us anything about the tone, but maybe it's telling us about the ma initial and the vowel A, yeah? But then we look further and we see this series where uh, it looks prima facie like there's two different vowels, right? There's A and there's Ye. Uh, there's also, again, multiple tones, but then also there's different initials. So it's not like the character, the phonetic is specifying the initial, but maybe it's specifying the place of articulation because these are all uh, bilabial stops, right? So those are the three initials. So now looking at this evidence, we can form a hypothesis that the phonetic component tells us the place of articulation of the morpheme that we're writing, uh, the place, place of articulation of the initial, right? Uh, and then uh, I won't go through this evidence uh, in detail again, but we find that in old poems, ah uh, and ye yeah, rhyme. So we suspect that actually some, somehow uh, they were originally the same vowel that then split in middle Chinese, but in old Chinese, they were the same vowel. So then we can uh, abide by our, uh, idea that uh, in old Chinese, uh, if two characters were written with the same phonetic uh, component, then they had the same uh, rhyme in old Chinese. So in, in I was using open syllable examples, but that was just to keep things simple. Uh, and, uh, and this is uh, Duan Yutsai's observation or hypothesis, let's say. Uh, and then uh, in terms of the initials, we say that they have the same uh, place of articulation. And actually, I'll just, uh, it's not in the slide, but I'll just specify that, that, that it tends to be stops uh, can be swapped around, like we saw with BP and PH, uh, or nasals. So, so it's, it's, it's also telling you something about the manner of articulation. You know, it's, it's basically saying nasal or not nasal. Uh, but anyhow, 
Uh, and then this is, you know, back to last time, this process of, so Duan Yutsai, he notices, oh, things with the same phonetic rhyme sometimes in the, in the churching. So then you take that as an observation and then you make it a dogma. They always rhyme. And that's going to be our methodological principle, right? Okay, so, uh, so now we're going to, and this is, I think, yeah, almost where we left off uh, yesterday. We're going to look at the uh, uh, Sheshung series. That's, that's a, a bunch of characters that are written with the same phonetic and, and see when they violate, apparently using middle Chinese readings, the Sheshung hypothesis. And then each such violation will inspire us to overcome it somehow uh, with a hypothesis about uh, initials, yeah? So uh, before getting to that, uh, I, I want to just avail myself of the tool of assigning morphemes in Chinese to two classes. And I want this at this point to be very formal like this, right? We're just assigning morphemes to two different classes. And we know these classes exist because, uh, because in Middle Chinese, the class V or type V, we say, uh, has an I in it. Now, you know, I, you say, okay, this is circular because I'm writing the I there in order to indicate that they're type B syllables. Yeah, but we have to, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good circularity. <laughs> we, we have to start somewhere. So we're starting with Middle Chinese. Uh, I'm writing Middle Chinese a certain way that it is a real distinction in Middle Chinese. We'll get to that. Uh, but uh, if you just are taking Middle Chinese as given, as if it were philologically attested in uh, Latin script, then you can say, okay, type B, whatever it is, is marked in middle Chinese with a medial I, yeah? Uh, and uh, here's just an example, a type A syllable, pang, and a type B syllable, pian, yeah? So, uh, you know, again, in the middle Chinese reading. Yeah, okay. So uh, this slide is just to now convince you that this isn't a distinction uh, that only exists in Middle Chinese, because Middle Chinese is Song Dynasty, right? So it's not Old Chinese. Uh, but some, not all Sheshun series, some Sheshun series, the bigger ones, for obvious reasons, because the, the bigger your Sheshun series is, the more you can use it to make fine phonetic distinctions. So the bigger Sheshun series split into, a, 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 I don't know what to call it, a cluster of characters that are indicating morphemes of type A and a cluster of characters indicating uh, type B. And you see that, or one thing that is important about this slide to realize that maybe I should have emphasized more yesterday is there's a tendency in the business even to talk about a Sheshan series as something flat, like this character and this character are in the same Sheshan series, as if it's a, a, a black and white question. You're either in the same Sheshan series or you're not, right? But in fact, uh, these are nested things, right? So if you take this little, this little guy here, you know, he is actually quite far from this guy, right? He uses a character that uses a character that's used in a character that's used in a character as phonetic. So um, in, in a sense, just intuitively, we would expect this character and you know, this character to maybe have less in common phonetically uh, than than, than a sort of hub does with its spoke, yeah? And each of these steps is at least providing an opportunity. And at this point, I'm, I'm again, just, we're doing it very sort of ahistorically, very kind of graph theoretically. Each step gives you an opportunity, at least, to make a further phonetic specification, right? And then we see, if we look at the readings here, that all of these ones are type A, which is to say there is no medial I, uh, and all of these ones are type B, which is to say there is a medial I, right? So, so we know that this distinction that in Middle Chinese is marked by I versus non-I existed already in Old Chinese. It's, it's built into the structure of Chinese characters, right? So that just means as a, as a kind of, um, how can I say, it, it's something now that we can put things in complementary distribution with because we know it existed in all Chinese, yeah? Whatever it was in all Chinese, okay. 
So uh, yeah, so now we're going to improve the conformity of Shechen uh, series to the Shechen hypothesis. And one of the tools uh, at our fingertips is this uh, classification of morphemes into type A and type B. Okay, so we uh, discussed this example yesterday. Uh, you look at it and you say, well, well, you know, there's all sorts of problems. If we believe in the Shesheng hypothesis, like uh, we have two different rhymes, U and E, uh, and we have several different initials, dentals, uh, retroflex, and palatals. Uh, now you notice actually already, just look at the rhymes, uh, like in this first example I gave of the ba and the bie, basically, we have uh, one rhyme in type A and one rhyme in type B, right? So the E's, none of them have a medial I, and the U's, all of them have a medial I, right? So you can already think, oh, it was probably one rhyme that split in Middle Chinese conditioned by the AB distinction. And then you might say the same thing about the initials, that uh, in particular, you know, for, 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 for now, uh, the first thing we'll do is say the palatals probably uh, palatalized uh, conditioned by type B syllables. Yeah, so there's what we say. We say uh, old Chinese T changes into middle Chinese Ch in type B syllables. I will uh, just, if you're wondering what's this character, it's the name for Ch yeah, <laughs> using uh, middle Chinese. So uh, for those of you who, who don't want to bother with that, just whenever you see middle Chinese Chinese character, Roman letter hyphen, you can ignore the Chinese character. But if you're actually you know, serious about um, doing Chinese historical phonology in somewhat longer term, it's probably good to memorize uh, which middle Chinese initials have which names in Chinese, yeah. So what is the Western name basin, like the, the or the... It's, um, the short answer is, it's the head word on the columns of the Che Yin Lue. <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll come back to it. But I mean, it, one way you can think of it is just like, if you study Chinese historical phonology in China today, that's what they would call that initial, yeah? They don't, this is, Chinese has its own tradition in this way. Like you don't say L initial, you say Lai Mu, yeah? And you only say that about Chinese. If you're talking about English or something, then you have some other word for L that's, that's translated from uh, a European language. Okay. So, uh, and then the other proposal is Old Chinese TR becomes Middle Chinese uh, uh, retroflex uh, in, in any syllable, I think. Uh, and then uh, DR becomes Do. Yeah. So, um, and then, you know, I'm not even sure we'll get to it in this course, but these proposals are also motivated by internal reconstruction of Middle Chinese. And, and uh, like one theme that, that I'll come back to is this coming back to things, right? That, that the, the evidence for, or the convincingness of different proposals comes from many different angles. Uh, but I'm finding, I find it, you know, just in terms of the organization of my own mind, and I would think maybe in yours, that it's useful to go through these things one at a time. Say, okay, now we're not talking about internal reconstruction of Middle Chinese. We're talking about what information is encoded in Chinese characters. So uh, the arguments for these proposals is only going to come from violations of the Shishan hypothesis. Okay. So here was, and this is where we did end last time, it's another series, and I'm trying to organize them to get kind of weirder and weirder, right? So the first one, you're like, oh yeah, sure. Dentals and, and palatals have some kind of context. You know, there's some kind of conditioning environment for the palatalization of dental. Seems quite normal to me, right? So now you try and use those tools you've just given yourself access to to solve this one. And you say, okay, well, then the D can stay. And the retroflex uh, probably comes from a medial R. But then you're like, well, what am I going to do with this? Yeah, I haven't, we haven't given ourselves a tool yet to get rid of the yeah. But these all need to have the same. Uh, place of articulation uh, in, you know, in order for us to 
win at the game, if you like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then the proposal that the discipline has come up with is L, right? So, uh, uh, oh yeah, so I just went through this actually. So never mind about that. But uh, what, so what can become a ya and a da? Well, the answer that, you know, that, uh, that we think that the, that the field of Chinese historical phonology has come up with is la. So then let's just uh, go through those proposals. Uh, so L becomes D in type A syllables, L becomes Y in type B syllables, and LR becomes D uh, in both type A and type B syllables. And D is excluded because then you would get your uh, J. So in the first uh, word, no, it's, so this could be a D. Like, like let's, yeah, this is a good question because it's giving us our sense of a Shishan, of the Shishan, how you use a Shishan hypothesis, right? So there's nothing, this could be a D in old Chinese. It really could be if we only knew about this character, yeah? If it were its own Shishan series, we would say, oh, it's a D, right? But how do we get this D to, and this ya to make sense, right? Why would you use a character that starts with ya as the phonetic in a character that starts with da? That is what motivates the hypothesis that uh, this isn't a da in old Chinese. So let's put it this way. Some middle Chinese does come from da. Some middle Chinese does come from la. Yeah, and uh, what you have, uh, let's say, if I can paraphrase the observation you've made another way, if I see a palatal mixed, if I see palatals and dentals mixed together in the Shishan series, then I reconstruct dentals. Whereas if I see, uh, I mean stops, if I see dental stops and palatal stops mixed together in a Shishan series, I reconstruct dentals. Yeah. But if I see uh, dental stops and ya, the glide ya, with no palatals, then I reconstruct it as a lateral. Yeah. And that's kind of the, the, the cookbook, if you like, approach to uh, you know, old Chinese historic phonology, which is, you can, you can think of it as a decision tree. I have a character that's a D in middle Chinese. Now I need to check, does it have Shishan series connections to palatals or does it have Shishan series, series connections to, uh, to, to the glide ya? Yeah. And actually, in my this yeah. L hypothesis, well, just intuitively, is a little bit expensive in the sense that you have then uh, L R. It's kind of uh, yes, that you uh, don't you don't like that, do you? Well, yeah. Well, I mean, that's something, something. yeah. Okay, I I agree. <laughs> that's that, that's all I'll say. Is I mean, but I I I blame myself. I say this is my ethnocentrism that I don't like. Lura, Lura, as a, <laughs> yeah. Um, there was a time, I'll say, and this I think is just how, in, in some ways, it's, it's actually, you know, again, my overall theme about methodology. There was a time around 2000 where we all got very L happy, yeah? And, uh, and basically, it's like it's like laryngeals in Indo-European, right? There is that moment where you're like, there's 30 laryngeals, right? Like whenever you see any problem, you just throw a new laryngeal at it, right? So we sort of went through that phase with with L in around you know 2002, uh, and then have sort of backed off, and and a lot of the Ds have changed back into Ds. Uh, but I think that's this is part of the kind of the the, the inevitable dialectic of research, right? Uh, and I am also concerned about uh, this LR. Yeah. Are we sure that um, that is supposed to die now? No. <laughs> no. I mean, <laughs> like, are, are, are we sure of anything in life? Uh, you know? Yeah, for example, an R is best or something. That would be this. Oh, uh, I'll get to that. Yeah, uh, in, in tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm confused about different things. So, how would like the, uh, the upper? Character that you're pronouncing middle Chinese. And like, is like the, what we would pronounce ta in like the modern Chinese, like, is this the base or, or the like, yeah, is the base? Yeah, because I'm not really. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, 
Yes, I should have. Is it intentional? Yeah, well, no, well, let's say it, it was intentional. It's not a mistake, but it was a pedagogical oversight, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, 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 these two characters are uh, paleographically linked. Uh, and there's no way you could have known that. Yeah, so I, sh I should have put this one up there. Yeah, uh, sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, last question, do X and H rhyme? Because we said that all of these have to rhyme, right? So the final X's and H's, yeah, the natural the, the, uh, Yeah, let's say uh, uh, for most purposes, um, old Chinese poets didn't care about this. Yeah, so they do rhyme. Like, um, you know, they don't have the same rhyme in, in, a, in a precise uh, phonetic sense, but uh, they, they, they do rhyme in the, in the churching. Um, uh, one way to put it, if you like, is old Chinese had no tongues, but actually that's, that, that, and that's, that's a way Qing phonologists put it. Um, but, uh, but of course, that's sort of just borrowing from Peter Debate Paul, right? Because, because then you're like, well, what, what was that stuff? It was still there, right? It was still something, even if it wasn't tongue. Yeah, but let's say whatever the X and the H represent was not uh, poetically uh, considered in writing poetry in the old Chinese period. Uh, okay, are we are we happy with laterals so, so far? It's just chosen because this this seems to be the, the most natural. Uh, yeah, if you I mean if you have a better idea, well, then this, this then be my guess. Yeah, we we want we want something that becomes a D in type A syllables and a ya in type B syllables. And then you say, well, it would help if I knew what the difference was between type A and type B syllables. And I would say, yes, it would help. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you, you get a kind of feel for it, right? Like, like, and you already have a little bit of feel for it. What is a type B syllable? Well, whatever a type B syllable was, it changed your dentals into palatals and it changed laterals into the glide ya. Yeah. So it's, it, it's definitely a kind of front happy thing, whatever it was, right? And well, yeah, I know the answer, but, but you gave uh, an example of uh, T, the red flex, shirt, and the uh, elephant shirt. Yeah. But, but similar series exist for the voice uh, B, because I'm glad you just insert the B there instead of L. Okay. Wait, what do you, what do you, uh, sorry, I lost you. What do you want to do? Well, you gave the voiceless uh, set for palatals, dentals, and retroflexes, but the voice set. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, this is, again, it's me trying to be easy, right? Like, which is to say, like, like I didn't give examples. Uh, yeah, like, why didn't I? No, I give. What is the type B first? What? Oh, jump. Yeah. So I should have said that, yeah. The, the only reason I didn't say that was because it wasn't on this slide, right? Because it wasn't in this, because this series happens not to have, yeah. Yeah, because I'm trying to build it up very sort of uh, empirically in that way. But now I see that uh, maybe I should have done two series and included one that did have a job. But yeah, duh becomes a job. Yeah. Um, let's see, where were we? Okay, so now we're ready to move on. Uh, we did this, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, and then, yeah, so I'm just now like writing it out, right? Sort of writing out our current uh, theory. Okay, so uh, this D comes from L and type A syllables, and this uh, the comes from R in type B syllables, and so on, right? And these just nice too. And then I'm not reconstructing the rhymes because we can't do everything at once, right? Uh, okay, so now what about, oh, I give away the answer, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, what, what about something like this? You say uh, Han and Nam, how can we make them come from the same place of articulation? 
Does anyone have any ideas? <laughs> okay. You guessed it. Uh, oh, no, first I'm just gonna give more examples. So uh, here uh, we have uh, ng, and then he, right? So you see that there's this, there's this connection between ha and, uh, well, both of these are uh, velar nasals. Yeah? So, so we need to somehow change these ha's into velar nasals, right? Uh, and uh, here's how we do it. We say their voiceless velar nasals in old Chinese get changed into, um, into, into ha, actually into, uh, I, I, I'm, this is my romanization, but it's actually an, uh, an X in IPA, so ha, yeah. Okay, so um, I wonder, do we, do we feel more or less scandalized by this proposal or by the LR? Personally, I, I find the LR more scandalous, but you know, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, so, so good, we're on the same page here. And then, uh, yeah, so in here's, yeah, I don't know uh, why I had that on a separate slide. Okay, uh, and then let's do it with M, which is we have, uh, we have M having a Sheshan connection with Ha, so we can reconstruct a voiceless bilabial nasal. Uh, okay. Uh, and then na, or rather, na, <laughs> yeah, okay. So you get the idea, but I, or now I'm sort of like tempted to just speed ahead because like, ah, now you get it, right? But I think it's good to sort of put your eyes on each one and say like, okay, uh, this one is pan, yeah? So uh, basically we, uh, yeah, how, how to put it, we've, it's like we want to get as much juice out of every new proposal, right? We don't want to propose new segments for every problem we see because then we'll end up with a lot of segments in old Chinese. So here, we don't get, I think this is right, we don't get ha in na Sheshang series, but we do get ta, yeah? So, uh, so why not say that the ta comes from Na in Taipei syllables, yeah. Uh, and and this is also, I think, not very scandalous, right? Like na becoming ta. I think that is a thing that happens around the world. Uh, okay. And then what about in type B syllables? Well, uh, and this is also where it's really useful to keep track of uh, when you see a phenomenon. Is it happening in type A syllables? Does it only happen in type A syllables? Does it happen in type B syllables? Does it only happen in type B syllables? And sure enough, you get shuz in na series, uh, and uh, but only in type B syllables. So then we can propose that na becomes ta in type A syllables and sh in type B syllables. And then we also have more evidence of what effects this type A, type B distinction uh, have. Yeah, and then I'll just point out kind of en passant that uh, here we have nya initial, uh, which is the regular type B development for an initial na, which is exactly parallel to ta becoming cha or da becoming ja, right? Which I also didn't mention earlier. Yeah. Well, what's the next uh, is S with the T? What are you asking? Are you pronounce yeah, that S with? Oh, it's a shot. Yeah. So, uh, so actually, in China, they like to write it uh, as a, a C with a little pale off of it, right? Uh, I think I have a pen here, right? So, uh, so, 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 uh, so I would write it like this, uh, and in China, they like to write it like this. And this is generally, I realize these these actually indicate different things in the IPA. But in general, I would say Chinese scholars love this symbol <laughs> and Western scholars prefer this symbol. I think our preference for this symbol is not as strong as the Chinese preference for this symbol, yeah? Um, uh, so, 
so you almost never see sha and ja in in Chinese language publications about any language. That's my observation. They just they just much prefer if they can to analyze it as this. And it usually doesn't matter because there aren't very many languages that distinguish them. Or I don't want to put it that way. Instead, I'll put it, there are many languages that do not distinguish them. Yeah. There are some, uh, including in China, that distinguish them. Uh, and in that case, I think both Chinese authors and Western authors distinguish them correctly, generally speaking. Um, but one reason I like this in the logical transcription, so I have to do this test with the ship, is that, you know, who cares? This is, we're doing phonology here, not phonetics, right? There's no way we will ever know uh, for sure, you know, where someone in 1500 BC uh, put their tongue on their, on their palate, right? Uh, so, uh, so that's why I like, I like these Indic um, transcriptions because it's a one way of reminding you that this is philology we're doing and not phonetics, right? Uh, but anyhow, that's, that's my answer. Yeah. Uh, and actually, if you like, you know, if you want to be precise about this, my writing S with a acute accent over it is my way of, of saying the Shu initial, right? Whatever the Shu initial is, which is why I have this Chinese character. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, uh, and then we get uh, retroflex. Uh, uh, so why not take that back to uh, and R, you know, so basically we're getting all of our retroflexes from medial R at this point. So then we have snu, right? And then that becomes ta. Okay. Um, and let me just say the point of this lecture uh, is to give you a sense of th the information that's in phonetic series, right? It's not to, to list you know, dozens of sound changes that I expect you to memorize by tomorrow, right? So if you feel a little bit like, oh, it's too much, then just, you know, go with the flow. Okay, uh, okay. so, uh, well, we, we have our voiceless nasals and we have laterals, so why not some voiceless laterals, right? Uh, and this, you know, now you see this, some of the symmetry of it too, right? If you look at this series, you have a ya and da. You know, if you only saw up to here, you would say, oh, a classic lateral series, mm -hmm. yeah? So uh, you would reconstruct la, oops, I should have made this, these into A's and B's, sorry about that. Uh, the, the, the little pharyngealization symbol, it, you can understand as, a, as an A, <laughs> uh, that's, I was, Planning to only say this later, but that's what Baxter and Cigar think type A syllables were, was for uh, But I, I think that's sort of best just understood as a, as a indexing of the distinction in their system. But anyhow, so, uh, so then we have these two characters in the, in, the, in the same series, and we don't have any solution yet, right? But you'll remember that, that we had na changing into ta, in type A syllables, and we had na changing to sha in type uh, B syllables, and you know, I don't know, laterals, dentals, na, na is a dental. So just sort of the symmetry of our proposal so far would say, well, why don't we then add a, a, a sha becomes sha in type B syllables, and sha becomes ta in type A syllables, yeah. And then we can make this series to fit with the Shesheng hypothesis. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, so how about a voiceless ra? So uh, here we have, I don't think I, no, I didn't go into this yet, but, um, but basically uh, you already know why we can't reconstruct L uh, in middle Chinese to L in all. Old Chinese, it's because we're already using L for something else, right? Because we've said L becomes D in type A syllables and becomes Ya in type B syllables. So where do the L's come from in Middle Chinese? Well, they come from R. Yeah. And actually, I don't think that this is like in Middle Chinese, L is not contrasted with R 
in early middle Chinese. So you could even decide to write these as an R. I don't think it really matters very much. Um, but uh, uh, anyhow, so uh, so then we take mechanically we take uh, L back to R and L back to R, and then we have this character which is K in an R series. So how do we fix that? How do we turn T into some kind of R? Well, uh, you look, N changes into T in type A syllables, and T changes into T in type A syllables. So how about T changes into T in type A syllables? You know? And then we're getting kind of, I don't know, something, some more general proposal like uh, acute voiceless resonance in type A syllables become tough, yeah? But it becomes phonetically further off, or what do you feel about them? I mean, it's closer in some way than and shut. Yeah. Or do you have any feeling or? I don't. You don't, you don't I, I don't have a feeling. The only thing that's bothered me so far is the LR, actually. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Uh, so that was, yeah. So then, uh, oh, yeah, that was in type A syllables. Yeah. Uh, so then in type B syllables, you probably want it it's to become a show, right? That's, 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 what, that's what you should have wanted. By this point, but you, we don't need it, right? Because there's no shows in in R like Sheshang series, but there are shows and in type B syllables only. Yeah, so we can then propose that in type B syllables, sha became cha. Yeah. So it's kind of like just you know, like I don't know, like a Rubik's cube or something. It's like what what all Chinese things have I already proposed that will allow me to solve other problems in Cheshang series, right? Sorry, I don't get this. Uh, is there an A shun, shun, or no? No, not. No, no. Take the so far. Yeah, well, no, there, well, there was, right? This oh, one, yeah, yeah. 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 No, so, so, so the only difference here is here it's a dental yeah. and here it's a retroflex. Yeah, but uh, but this one uh, fits the patterns we've seen so far, right? Na becomes ta, shla becomes ta, shra becomes ta in type A syllables. Whereas na becomes sha, shla becomes sha in type B syllables. So we kind of expect shra to become sha, but it, it, but it doesn't. Or uh, to be more precise, we, we don't find it convenient to propose that it does because we don't get shas showing up in the place where we would want to use that proposal. But instead, what we do get is tra, yeah? Uh, showing up in type B syllables in Sheshan series that are basically rotated, yeah? So that's why we propose this. And then if you like, you know, somehow the roticity uh, was predominant in this case and, uh, you know, uh, sort of treated it as if it were a, a medial R, right? Like I'm being very imprecise here, but medial R has been giving us retroflexes, yeah. So, I mean, I, and, and I would welcome you to like, don't believe any of these proposals. Right? I was wondering whether the notation you're using is based only on the two articles that you wrote or like also like the phonetic alphabet. Maybe I'm not following something because I studied that a while ago, but. Uh, okay, yeah, so the middle Chinese, is is what I proposed in my in my article from last year. Yeah. Mm, okay. Uh, and then the old Chinese, I'm proposing like in this room right now, right? Um, and it's basically IPA. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the 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 romanization of of Chinese characters is. We make it to today, we make it to tomorrow, which is what's in that other article of mine. Yeah. Uh, right. Okay. okay thank you. Uh, any other? Yeah. Uh, do, do you think it makes sense? What would be a reason for to use it? 
non-retroflex circuit can have AC loads and the retroflex circuit can have AC loads. It must have something to do with whatever the type AB distinction is. And um, yeah, this, <laughs> this, is, this is something I look forward to you writing an essay about. I'll, I'll try my best to solve this I mean, I don't like, I should just say, I'm not a phonetician. And in a sense, neither am I a Chinese historical phonologist. Right? Um, so, so, so I see this as just like, you know, I'm teaching you the, the catechism of the, of the church of Chinese historical phonology. And whether or not you believe it is your own business. Yeah. Um, at, at least, it, I mean, let's say at least in the first instance, right? Like, yes, we like. I I think that uh, basically that that by the end of the two weeks, you should have a, a, your own sense of which of these hypotheses are really uh, built on rock and which of them are built on sand, right? And then. Uh, but the other thing to that actually makes it extremely hard to read about uh, old Chinese historical chronology is that all of the hypotheses are interlinking in a really intricate way. So if you change something, then then everything sort of you know it's not that everything collapses, but everything is somehow moved. Yeah. So so that makes it like if if there's two people writing about Chinese historical chronology and and they 95% agree with each other, that 5% of disagreement will have all sorts of consequences uh, that will make it hard for you as an outsider to read them and think they're talking about the same language, right? I think that's, that's a problem. Uh, and, and it's kind of, that is the thing that I think is most important to kind of convey to you, right? It's like, you can't just pick up an article about old Chinese historical phonology and read it and trust that the symbols mean what they mean when talking about other languages. It's all about uh, these interlocking hypotheses. And for each hypothesis, either you accept it or you don't, right? Um, yeah. So, is, yeah. Is this for you an argument to look for R because it comes out here as reference? Well, it's, it's sort of this. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 I would say, let's just stick with the main reason for reconstructing R is that it's in an R series, right? And then you say, why am I calling this an R series when the only things in it are two L's and a retroflex? Uh, yeah. And I'll say, because I can't reconstruct it as L because I've already used L for solving this D meets Y problem. Yeah, but if L is a the, like a new quote, for instance, we could reconstruct L here, but that would square less well with the retroflex we're getting. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is say, I think that the fact that this comes out as retroflex uh, at a minimum a nice bonus. is a nice bonus. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, now let's just sum up. I think we're going to sum up on voices resonance. Yeah. So this is a little bit of intellectual history. So uh, Dong Fang Ha uh, is the first person who proposed uh, the labial, the voice of labial nasal, uh, and and then and then uh, Polly Blank said, "Oh, that's a great idea, and let's use it for velars and labial velars." And uh, and all this other stuff, right? Uh, and then uh, Baxter is the one who added the voiceless rotor. So that was there were sort of three major moments in the proposals of these voiceless resonance. Uh, first comes the M. Then Polyblank made basically all these other proposals, uh, except for the last one we covered, which is the voiceless rhotic that Baxter proposed. And and so I actually think that the sort of Exercise we just did, uh, although I think I started with the velars rather than the rather than the labials, uh, sort of models the history of the discipline in terms of someone comes up with an idea for a specific situation, and then someone sees that there's an, an analogous use that can be put to the analogous idea. Yeah. Okay, so that's it for voiceless resonance. Uh, oh, and then just to yeah, Baxter and Cigar agree with all that because they're they're the uh, 
if you like, the, the for my purposes, the locus classicus of, you know, uh, of all Chinese today. Yeah. So here's summing up uh, voiceless resonance. So uh, should all look familiar. Nga and ma in type A syllables become pa, uh, and then in type uh, B syllables they also become pa. Uh, and then uh, na, la, and tra become fa in type A syllables, uh, and then na and fla become sha in type B syllables, and then shra becomes ka in type B syllables. And then this starts to look, I don't know, natural might be the wrong word, but, but elegant, right? Yeah. Uh, and then you'll also see that there's a, a, a kind of split that happens a lot in Chinese historical chronology between uh, what Jakobson would call grave initials and acute initials. So labials and velars are grave and then uh, everything else is acute. Uh, it seems to be that this terminology, although Jakobson proposed it not for old Chinese, but for you know, phonology in general, has gone way out of fashion, <laughs> uh, except in old Chinese historical phonology, as far as I know. I, don't, I never hear people talking about grave and acute initials, but we find it very useful because uh, then you have a cover term for, you know, stuff at the, at the, basically stuff at the extremes of the mouth is grave and stuff at the middle of the mouth is acute. Yeah. And, and, and these kind of patterns happen all the time in the development of Chinese where, where labials and velars work one way and where other stuff works another way. Uh, okay. So that was uh, it for uh, voiceless resonance, and I just want to remind ourselves what we're doing here, right? We're still, we're still just uh, looking for problems in Sheshan series, and then coming up with proposals that will uh, change those problems, which are Middle Chinese problems, into solutions for Old Chinese, right? Uh, where we get to believe in the Sheshan hypothesis that uh, there are homo organic initials in all Sheshan series. So now we're going to come to uvulars, and I'll just say that basically the voiceless resonance, most of the discipline agrees with. I think not in Peking, although I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, now uvulars, a lot of people are still on the fence about. And then I'll tell you, my feeling is the, the approach we've been taking methodologically means we should march on ahead and add the uvulars. And, and I see it only as a kind of conservatism, which is if you grew up with voiceless resonance, but not with uvulars, then you say, oh, these uvulars are crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you, you know, if you grew up like I did with, <laughs> with uvulars already in the air, then it seems perfectly uh, sensible, these proposals. Okay, so let's move on to the uvulars. Some Shishun series uh, have connections between velars and glottals uh, or velars and the glottal stop or initial ya. Yeah. yeah, so uh, so that's bad from the Sheshun hypothesis perspective. Velar should be velar, glottal should be glottal, right? They're different and and ya should be, I don't know, uh, like a lateral series maybe, yeah. Uh, so it, we have these cases of, of uh, non-homo organic Sheshun series uh, that we will try to fix by proposing uh, uvulars. So here's uh, one series. Uh, so we've got, uh, we've got a K and then this dot, which is in, in uh, Unicode is called the sinological dot. Yeah, uh, uh, that we use for, or I use for, uh, but it's not just, let's say, the fact that it's called the sinological dot tells you that there is a certain tradition behind it in sinology. We use this middle dot for the global stop. Uh, and then the H is for the H, and then uh, the, then this is my convention, which which I realize is there are problems with it, uh, but uh, it's it's best I've been able to come up with so far. That's the voiced equivalent, so it's a gamma in IPA. So it's a H, yeah. Uh, and you could use the gamma, but I, then I don't like mixing Greek and Roman letters personally, uh, and you know. What else are you going to do? You could do a G with a hat on it or something like that. But, um, but it, I think it's nice to have these as a pair. Yeah. Anyhow. Yeah. So 
right? Yes, these are not, these are middle Chinese. So these are uh, so we have velar, glottal, velar, velar. Yeah. Although do notice that the velars are fricatives, which we haven't seen coming up in velar series so far. Um, now maybe that's just because you know we haven't been together very long. But K and P A first are combined here together with global salt. Oh. Yes. Yeah. This is the first time you have seen P and R. Although I will tell you that R does occur in. Uh, Vehler series, but I think HUD doesn't occur in Vehler series, which is to say, like, um, I, I mean, I should put this more precisely. If you see a H, you're very likely to see a glove stop. Whereas if you see a R, you might see, for instance, a G, uh, a G, yeah, which is to say, there are two kinds of, you know, in the same way we had dental series and lateral series. We have velar series and we have what I'll call uvular series. And what's characteristic of a uvular series, first and foremost, is the glottal stop. That's why it's a violation of the Shechem hypothesis, right? It's the glottal stop that's doing, it's creating the problem for us. But I will also just point out that it tends to be only in series of that type that the, that the hub comes up. Which is a, what I'm writing as an H. Yes. You could switch these, right? Because you say you use Indic transcription, but the Indic H is the voice one, right? And you could use the Zaka. Then. Yes, uh, that is something I have thought of. Uh, but uh, the thing you're writing. Pardon? In the Indic tradition? In, well, no, in Indic, they don't use this, right? They use a dot. Yeah, exactly. And That's they use the voice. dot for the voiceless. Yeah. Um, this thing occurs too. It's not yeah. like in, in Vedic or something? I don't think I've seen this in Sanskrit. Yeah. That's just an other part of this. Yeah, but I mean the, the character is already. Yeah, yeah, exactly. oh. yeah. 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 Well, so what does it mean in, in Sanskrit? F. It means F. Yeah. Ah, okay. Well, well that's a h before p in p h. Uh, okay. Well, the 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 reason I use it is because it's used in Hittite, yeah, uh, which is not, you know, and it's used in Hittite. I think for 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 gamma or for a for x. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that that's why I like it. <laughs> yeah. um, you don't want to take to, to make systems, right? So you. Yeah, okay. well, and, and that's exactly why I don't. So, so I, and I'm probably the only person on earth who has this problem, wants to write Tibetan, Burmese, and Chinese like on the same page, right? So, I don't want to use uh, an H with a dot under it now for a Visarga and now for a Gamma and now for no, I want everything to be transparent. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's, you know, uh, yeah. So, uh, anyhow. So uh, let's move along. Uh, so we're going to propose that this glottal stop comes from a Q. And now that doesn't get us everything, yeah? But it's, it's a step, yeah? We're going, we're going to make a uvular series and the, 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 the problem is the glottal stop. So we bring the glottal stop back to a Q, yeah? Uh, in, like B syllables, at least. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, how about saying that this huh goes back to a, uh, I mean, I, so, <laughs> maybe you can come up here and make all these noises for us. Yeah. <laughs> I always feel embarrassed at this point. Like, I don't know. Oh, uh, yeah. No, it needs to be farther back than that. Oh, <laughs> I, I'm not a phonetician. I'll just read it out. Q H. Yeah. Uh, okay, so so her the X in IPA we will propose comes from QH. This all seems reasonable to me. Uh, and then uh, the 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 R, the gamma. How about it comes from the capital G? Yeah. So this is our uh, uvular uh, idea, and you say, well, K, Nathan, but where does that K come from? Yeah. Sorry, but this predicts, but maybe already said it that. 
also plus dealers does not include the D or uh, no, no, you, you are saying something that makes sense given what I've said so far, but I would say uh, we also shouldn't have the K, right? Like, where's the K coming from? Yeah. Where's the K coming from? Yeah. And the answer is worry about it later. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, so things are starting to look better, right? Oh, now, now, now we're feeling good. Okay. We still haven't dealt with the K, but. Um, but, but look, you know, the K uvulars somehow turning into velars is also not a big deal, right? So, so we need a conditioning environment to get the K out of a uvular and we also need to propose which uvular it comes from. But so, you know, I mean, I, I think we're, I, I feel like this is going nicely, right? In terms of solving this Shishan theory. So yeah. Why why uh, soft and not a bit Because you turn it into a right? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I would say probably because the glow stuff is a glow stuff. So it's all based on that. Yeah. Law Yeah. <laughs> I know the the thing is we don't um we uh, like like in Baxter and cigars. Old Chinese, the only fricative is S. And I think there's something nice about a language with only one fricative that's S, right? Like that's, that's how a proper language behaves. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but or, or I can make a stab at it in another way and say like, maybe they were phonetically uh, spirantized under, under certain conditions. Uh, and in fact, they must've been at some point because they turned out to become fricatives. Uh, but it's not a phonological issue because it wouldn't have been contrastive. And actually, I mean, I don't really know languages that, um, like, I don't speak any languages that have uvulars in them. No, from a, what I've read, like, for instance, Sunda, which is an isolate from Nepal, is analyzed as having phonological uh, uvulars, but they kind of pop up as all sorts of stuff, like ya and various kind of fricatives. Uh, I, I, I think that the phonetics of uvulars can be quite uh, glamorous, yeah. And uh, the K comes from the uvulus also? Yes, I mean, it, we, it has to, right? Uh, like, that is here, it's not because the frictions go to the Uh, Yeah, good point, yeah, good point, yeah. That's a good point. That's what I should have said. Yeah, sure. <laughs> that's not saying. Yeah, I mean, no, it's true that, that sometimes fricatives can turn into stops. But only a subspace. Uh, or under quite. Yeah, under, okay, unconditional. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Yeah. That would be very cautious because uh, I think you need it for this. Um, I need what? Well, something needs to stop by there. Oh, yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, uh, but these aren't fricatives. Well, it's a uh, particular. Yeah. But, okay. Yeah. So for for those of you online, we're worrying about whether voiceless resonance are fricatives or stops. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, in any case. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's not no no problem, right? Like, uh, we also have a series where uh, ya is connected to velars, and uh, let's try to solve those with uvulars. Where the main motivation is actually that we that we have uvulars now available, yeah, uh, and uh, we have a conditioning environment which is type B before front vowels, right? So if you look at uh, here, what was it? It was type, the, the G is a type A, it's also before back, back vowel, yeah? Whereas uh, here, uh, this G we're using uh, type B uh, and before front vowel. So uh, why not use this capital G to solve this, Link between velars and uh, yeah, uh, 
uh, in this series as well. Yeah. Uh, did I just? Oh no, sorry. Yeah. See, the the nice lesson is there's too many of these rules, <laughs> so I can't give them straight either. Uh, I this is unconditioned. It's it's in type B syllables. Uh, whereas this is the conditioning one, condition one, which is uh, type A syllables before front vowels. Yeah. Right. Uh, and here, yeah, here is a nice, this is a nice uvular series where you see like, you know, if you only looked at this one, you'd say, look, wh why are you tempted to take this back to uvulars at all? Right? Like, ya isn't a uvular, ka isn't a uvular. But uh, in a longer series or a different series, here we get the ya and the ha and the glossa and the gam. Right. So this is a, this kind of all the machinery that we proposed so, so far for uvulars gets to be used here. And in fact, one more piece of machinery, which is that uh, this uh, becomes a, uh, a ya before um, front vowels. And uh, we've also switched to uh, labio uvulars, but basically, you know, the labi, labi, what do you, what, what's the nominal form? The label, lab, the labialness uh, we need because of the labial, right? In the, the medial labial. Uh, and then at this point, you could say, yeah, but why do you want to stick that in the initial? Why don't you just have that as a medial? And that would be a very reasonable point at this point, uh, very reasonable thing to suggest at this point. Uh, but uh, later I will, I will get to probably uh, that uh, we we generally want to put our labials into the into the initial. Yeah. You know? Okay. And now, uh, yeah. The uh, type B I gets in between. Don't let the like. Don't think of this as a two syllable word. This is a one syllable morph. Yeah. I could also put it on top of the W. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if you like the 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 Venus is is indicated with an I and the rounded vowelness or the rounding of the syllable is indicated with the W. Yeah. I, I like this convention because it is quite legible, you know, as an angle font. You can say ye when, yeah, but that's of course not actually what's going on. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, and then uh, this initial, which is actually just uh, type B gamma, in Middle Chinese they distinguish, for whatever reason, uh, the philological tradition distinguishes sort of usual gamma and type B gamma. Uh, so uh, we're going to use bilabial capital, sorry, la uh, voiced labio uvular as our default reconstruction of the origin of uh, this gamma in type B syllables. And this is, I think maybe just since this, I don't know, it will be the sort of motif. What, what are the moves that we distrust, right? The first one I think was this LR. This is the second one for me, which is it's like the first time we've said, eh, and, and anything else like that. Yeah, like, uh, but Baxter and Sagar uh, say like, look, well, I have this, this available and I need it sometimes. So why don't I just use it everywhere? And actually now that I put it that way, it sounds like a methodology I should endorse given everything I said yesterday. Uh, but somehow it, you know, I, it slightly makes me clutch my pearls to say like, uh, I, I would really like to have an argument for the uvularness of every series that you make this move in rather than just make it as a default. But anyhow, they make it as a default. Um, Okay. Yeah, and then this uh, hypothesis does account for the distribution of, uh, of of this initial, which is only in type B syllables with medial one. Okay. And then here's uh, an ex uh, a series that will that, that that we will you know use uh, as evidence for this proposal. So uh, we've got a, uh, wait, no, we've got a glottal. We've got a glottal. Oh, that should have been an I. I'm sorry, that's a typo. Uh, so we've got a glottal here, we've got a glottal there. So we've got our glottal mixing with velars. So it's a uvular series. 
Uh, and then we'll take this one back to type the uh, labio uvular, voice labio uvular. And then you see we do get a G. Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's something. Uh, actually, we can even probably put a little more flesh on the bones, say there's something that there's some conditioning environment that probably takes capital G to uh, velar and that takes capital Q to velar, right? But what is that conditioning environment? We haven't, we, we, we haven't uh, seen any reason for it. It's not type A versus type B, right? Which is the only conditioning environment that we have so far have access to. Okay, so uh, summing up on uvulars, uh, Pang Wuyun is the person who proposed uvulars. Uh, he, and, and basically for this purpose, for dealing with glottal velar uh, links in Shetran series, but he, his proposals are not the same as Baxter and Cigar's. And in fact, Baxter and Cigar uh, kind of around 2010, like switched some of the proposals they were making. And one thing that you, know, you, you can feel entitled to complain about in their work is that when they change their mind, they never, they never sort of tell you why they changed their mind. They just tell you why they think what they now think, as if they had never thought something else. Right? Uh, and I think from their perspective, that's just like, well, life is short. And it's better to do new cutting edge work than to apologize for mistakes you've made in the past. But it does. Uh, I don't know, it, it makes their work slightly hard to use. I think that, you, that you're never quite sure. Like if you're convinced by what they thought in 2010 and then they're saying something else in 2014, you wonder, you know, what did I do wrong? <laughs> that I allowed myself to be convinced. Uh, but anyhow, uh, the proposals that I just talked to you through are their 2014 proposals. Yeah. Uh, and I will just uh, sort of cheating slightly, take a sneak peek at other evidence. Uh, uh, Alex, uh, Sasha Boban uh, has an article where he thinks that this, uh, which is a, um, these, these are both sort of titles used by barbarians, like, uh, you know, in, in the Han Dynasty, like, oh, the, the Xiongnu chieftain or something. So he takes this one back to Proto Yenisean, great ruler, uh, and then he and then he proposes uh, this one's related to old Turkey Takkan, and in both cases we have uvulars where Baxter cigar have proposed uvulars. There's other problems that you'll see uh, on this slide, and I don't feel married to this proposal, but I mean I do I do think it has the advantage of uh, being kind of independent, you know, a researcher from Baxter and cigar, uh, and maybe suggests that oh yeah there were some uvulars in some of the places they thought there were uvulars. Okay, and then here's the summing up of uvular developments. So, uh, and then I had to break these, just the slide was a little bit too big to fit on one. So uh, in type A syllables, you see what you get. Yeah. Uh, and then I do both the, with the non, the, the, the straight uvulars, if you like, and then the labial, la labial uvulars. Uh, and then that's in type A, and that's in type B, where then we have this little note here about uh, we become this initial before A or E. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and that's the end of uh, of that presentation. Oh, um, so there is this question about why a particular character is type A and not type B. And I'll say it, um, like maybe I made a mistake, uh, but it, it's like, how do I know whether something's type A or type B? I look it up in middle Chinese uh, and there are places you can do that, like uh, um, that, like a million different homepages. Uh, Wiktionary, for instance, will tell you. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you don't look at type, in middle Chinese, we don't talk about types, we talk about uh, grades and type B is grade three and anything else is type A. So there's four grades in middle Chinese. We'll get to this later. Uh, and grades one, two, and four, we call type A and grade three, we call type B. So that's, that's how I know whether a particular uh, character is. I look it up on the Wiktionary and I see what grade it is. 
Yeah. Um, and that's and that's based on Middle Chinese rhyme books and, and rhyme tables. Uh, any questions? Could you maybe tell us more about the like, Middle Chinese phonology and phonetics then? Like, because you said, like, we assume, uh, I assume just for the purpose of this class, that like we know how Middle Chinese sounded more or less, or, like what the phonology of Middle Chinese was, but do we actually know? Like, is this you know, written somewhere? Yeah, Middle Chinese is basically attested. Like, oh, right. So um, so we'll get to that kind of in the last couple of days of the course because I'm treating things chronologically. Right? So we're starting with the phonetic information in the Chinese script because that's the oldest source we have about Chinese historical phonology. Uh, whereas um, Middle Chinese, we, we basically have one clutch of sources from the seventh century and then one from the 12th century. So we have a long way to go until we get there. Uh, and you know the the other way you could do it is by sort of having one week on middle Chinese, one week on old Chinese. Um, yeah, maybe I should have done that, but I but I I I think it's you know I don't know I like old things <laughs> um, and, and middle Chinese historical phonology gets like pr precisely because it's so well attested. I think that uh, once you've been through the kind of uh, meat grinder of middle Chinese. You'll come out saying, "Oh yeah, his his romanization is actually okay." Yeah, so <laughs> so then I feel like, well, let's just use it uh, for a while as a crutch. Uh, Professor Hell. Yeah, I kind of just have the clarification question. So yeah. on the slide, um, where it's type B, and you know the voice uveal or labial uh, turns into yun, which is he otherwise. Yeah. Uh, on that side, you have an uh, you have a character transcribed into glottal stop dots and the uh, J. So I kind of just yeah, that's a typo. Yeah, I it. think it's it's it should be an I. Okay. The, the it I see. Be an I yeah, that's because Baxter uses J for ya like because right of, right. But I think yeah. that's confusing, uh, so I use I. Uh, and, I see. And then I make it more confusing by having typos. <laughs> Uh, that's somehow I'm realizing actually that I should keep track of these things. So um, maybe send me an email to, and then I'll fix that typo. And if anyone else noticed any typos, let me know, and then I'll fix them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last chance for a question. Oh, if I may yeah. ask about, um, so it's not every word with i then it will be necessarily be type b uh it sh generally speaking it should be uh it, the one problem is what if the actual nuclear vowel is i and there's you know so so if you see di in middle chinese that's not type b so is um so it's sort of like if I plus a another vowel that yeah. probably if, if, you, if, if you have I plus another vowel, then it's type B. And if you only have I, you would have to check the initial because because it'll it if it's a dental initial, it has to be uh type A. If it's a palatal initial, it will be type B, right? Because we covered that. Uh, so if it's yeah. like um if like of like just like y i w e n then it will it will not necessarily be type b because it's not directly adding wall oh no 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 that's always anything that starts anything that has i w is type b and, that, okay. and this, that these things should all be covered in my my article about my middle chinese transcription although i can, i realize that you know it'll be full of middle chinese jargon it won't mean anything to you but you know um okay then we'll stop here and i'm glad to see that the technological side of things worked better today uh so we'll see everyone in the same place uh at the same time tomorrow yeah okay